Good evening and welcome to tonight's candidate forum. I'm Jean Fiddler from the League of Women Voters in Minnesota. Um, I'd like to thank the Highland District Council, the Matt Groblin District Council, and the NAACP's St. Paul chapter for co-sponsoring this event with the League of Women Voters of St. Paul. I'd also like to thank uh, the Highland Park High School for allowing us to use their venue tonight. The views expressed in this forum are those of the candidates, not those of the League, and sponsorship of this forum is not an endorsement of any candidate by the League. All viable candidates have been invited to the forum. So we'll begin with our introductory statements, two minutes each, starting with Sharon Anderson. <sighs> Hurrah, Semper Fi, to any veterans in the audience. And on the grave of my second husband, a Silver Star Marine veteran, Purple Heart, and on and on. I also want to give some love to you. Namaste, namaste, I guess they say it. From the heart, it's soul. So remember that. My favorite saying, because I'm blind in my left eye, and I've had nine eye doctors, and I got kicked out of the one doctor's office for asking for medical marijuana. But my right eye can see, believe me. So the quote from Helen Keller, I cried because I had no shoes until I met a man who had no feet. Don't underestimate me. Today, there was a huge fire at 200 Dayton. I grew up at 617 Dayton, and then... Uh, Dayton and uh, McCubbin, I guess it was. My heart breaks. There were 10 people in that fire today. The fire's in California. Well, we've got a fire going on in St. Paul. So my namaste, especially to Barnabas for biblical reform. Trayon, he's not here, exposing cop stuff, and me, all three in poverty, homeless at times. We paid a $500 filing fee, not to win, but to expose what's going on, to educate you guys out there. I went to Eastern Heights grade school, Ames Junior High School, Marshall, Central, and I didn't know that Tran went to Central. Okay, I'm wearing my bedroom slippers today because my feet hurt. <laughs> and uh, I've got back and migraine. I don't like this getting older, but I still have the passion. I'm the only blogger in the group. I've got over 100 blogs, thousands of PDF files. For in, oh, i got 30 seconds. OK, I've get, I got to stop. Thank, Thank you. you for being here. <laughs> Melvin Carter. Good evening. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Melvin Carter, and I'm pleased to be a part of this conversation and pleased that so many of you came out. Uh, I'm a fourth generation St. Paulite. My, my great grandparents came here 100 years ago fleeing violence and oppression of the Deep South. Uh, I'm a lifelong DFLer and a proud product of the St. Paul Public Schools. So if you went to uh, Highland, please don't hold it against me that I'm a Central graduate. Um, I'm, I'm running for office endorsed by our governor, Mark Dayton, by our city employees union, by our city's teachers union, by our city council president, Russ Stark, and a majority of our teachers union. I'm, I'm sorry, by, and a majority of our school board. I, I'm, I'm running for mayor because in St. Paul, I'm raising my children in a city where a child born in our city, we can more accurately predict her life outcomes for too many children based on her race, her zip code, and her parents' education than we can based on how smart she is and how hard she works. That's not fair to her, and it's not sustainable for our community. So I'm running to build a city that works for all of us. That, to me, starts with schools that serve all of our families and children. It means a local economy that works well for all of our families and neighborhoods, and that really means city services from street plowing to, to community policing that work really well uh, in all of our communities. We see in St. Paul disparities that lead the nation, and they're the result of policy and resource decision making that for generations has left out of the conversation too many people in too many parts of our city. I'm running to change that. I'm running as someone who knows what it feels like to be pulled over for driving while black, who knows what it feels like to sit as a student in our schools and to stand on a block that's been devastated by foreclosures. We have a whole lot of opportunity in front of our city and 
bringing more voices to the table is key to changing and building the city for the future that our children deserve and will be excited to live in. I'm running to build that city. Thank you. Thank you. Elizabeth? My name is Elizabeth Dickinson, and I am the Green Party candidate for mayor. I'm guided by the values of social, economic, and environmental justice, nonviolence, and grassroots democracy. And I've also been endorsed by Sierra Club, Clean Water Action, and Women Winning. My political experience includes being the community affairs manager at the Minnesota AIDS Project, where I lobbied on health care at the Capitol. I also worked on Becky Lori's campaign for governor, and I worked for the Association for Non-Smokers on the smoking ban, and for Healthy Legacy, trying to get toxic chemicals out of uh, consumer products. And I also worked for the National PTA, trying to raise educational standards. So as you can see, I have a very broad background. And so what I like to say about it is that I'm a classic insider-outsider, which is I know how to work within government and how to get things done. I've been a community organizer, and uh, one of the things I'm best known for is probably helping clean up the coal burning plants about a dozen years ago. But I'm also for other things, like raising the minimum wage, because we have a poverty problem in St. Paul, where at least 25% of our people are living in poverty. And by raising the minimum wage to $15, phased in over four to seven years, we know that we can raise 67,000 St. Paulites out of poverty. And there is no one thing that I could do as mayor that would have a greater effect in lifting people out of poverty than that one thing. But I'm also for transparent, responsive, innovative, accessible, diverse government. That begins with working with the city council and community councils and making sure that everyone's voice is heard and that everyone has a seat at the table. Thank you so much. Tom Goldstein. Um, thank everyone for being. Uh, thank thank you everyone for being here and for Lee Women Voters for hosting another event. Um, I'm Tom Goldstein, running for mayor. I'm a former school board member. I uh, had a business on Grand Avenue for many years in Marshall Avenue called the Sports Collection. I'm a lawyer by training. Um, those of you who read the Highland Villager regularly uh, may know me for my uh, outspoken opinions about fun public funding of stadiums, about breaking up the cable monopoly of Comcast and CenturyLink, about fighting against teardowns that negatively impact our neighborhoods with McMansions. And I've been very clear about the Ford plant redevelopment, my concern about a $275 million subsidy for that when we don't know what the project's going to be, and it only includes $25 million for affordable housing. Now, I could have sat silent, could, you know, could have just been someone that went around and glad-handed people and kept my mouth shut about stuff, but that's not the way I'm wired, and I don't, I don't think that's what we need in the community. We need someone that's going to speak out, and I think people should speak out about the things that they care about. Um, and some of you, if your only view of me is through the high end vill villager, you may see me as someone what, as one-dimensional, but I'm not. I've actually spent my career post-business working as an affordable housing advocate, creating pro bono opportunities for law students at the University of Minnesota Law School as a union rep on the school board and many years as a community advocate. Um, in the course of this campaign, everyone has become a neighborhood advocate. Everybody wants to change the status quo. No one is part of the status quo, including our former elected officials. But I think from the s it's been clear from the start that I want to change how we do things at City Hall, that I want it to be transparent so that we know what's going on, we know where the money's being spent, that we don't allow our streets to fall into disrepair, that we don't keep subsidizing stadi stadiums and entertainment venues that eat up our tax subsidies, and that we're actually working to support education and the kinds of things that will lift up our community. So that's the kind of campaign I'm running. I am someone who will change things at City Hall, and I think I will change them for the good, and I will fight for neighborhoods, and there's been no confusion about where my loyalties lie. Thank you. Thank you. Pat Harris. Thank you so much. Just got here in the nick of time, it looks like. Uh, thank you all for being here tonight. I, I, I'm excited to be here. Uh, um, I'm Pat Harris, running for mayor. Uh, my wife, Laura, and I and our four children live uh, just a short walk from where we're sitting here today. Um, all my life, uh, I, I've been about making a difference for St. Paul. I spent 12 years on the city council representing this neighborhood where I was a leader on the budget where I was a leader on our libraries. I created St. Paul's Independent Public Library Agency, which resulted in the Rondo Library, the Arlington Library, re renovations to Highland, Sunray, and Latimer Central. 
was a leader on affordable housing for our community and leader on many other things in our community. In 2004, I passed St. Paul's Sanctuary City Ordinance uh, um, uh, and, and feel very strongly about that yet today. My wife, Laura, and I are involved in numerous nonprofit organizations, the Children's Museum, the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library, Como Zoo Friends, and so many other organizations that we've made a difference for for, for over 25 years. I, I have 18 years of private sector public finance uh, experience where I've made a difference for cities, schools, and counties all over the country on how they run their finances and how they provide the services to, to their communities in the most efficient manner possible. I'm the founder of the Serving Our Troops program. And we've served 90,000 stakes to the soldiers and families of the Minnesota National Guard, recognizing the sacrifice that they make so that we can be in rooms like this here today. I I'm excited about the possibilities. Uh, um, I I I'm, I'm proposing bold programs on jobs, on city services, on education, and, and I'm looking forward to making a difference for this neighborhood, for every neighborhood in the city of St. Paul. Looking forward to your support and looking forward to this great discussion. Thank you for the league for putting on this forum. Thank you so much. Thank you. <coughs> Chris Holbert. It's been a long time since I've been in high school, so when I uh, entered, I immediately went to the restroom and smoked a cigarette for old time's sakes. My second thought was when I sat down, I'm glad I didn't wear a skirt tonight. Um, my name is Chris Holbrook. I have lived in the Midway and Frogtown neighborhoods for 18 years. Um, it, and it, Tom brings up the villager. I don't know if you've all seen the copy that was released today. I'm just going to read the headlines to you. The council okays a forward site plan despite deep divisions. The city is to vote on restricting menthol tobacco sales. The city looks to let the air out of short-term B&Bs with taxing and licensing. St. Paul negotiating regulations on carryout packaging. Property taxpayers will feel the pain with big gains and levies. Apartments, properties are facing double-digit uh, double tax hikes. This reads like the intro to a Greek tragedy. And if you want more of this, half the people on this stage developed that. I'm running in contrast to the big government people. I'm running as a fiscal conservative my priorities are to lower property tax. The issues we have right now are mismanagement of priorities. We overspend on all projects by millions of dollars. We overregulate businesses, and we've not solved our racial disparities. I have solutions. I offer reducing residential property tax by spreading out the base. I would like to put a ban on banning things, and I would like to freeze or lower wage mandates, and drug possession arrests. The results are logical. It will put more money in everyone's pocket, making things more affordable. It will bring jobs. It will um, basically let you live your life as you wish. I would lastly reiterate a statement I've made every chance I get to these candidates. Whoever becomes mayor, please lower the property tax burden. It's strangling the residents. And I ask for $1 million uh, reduction for every 1% of the vote given to me. Thank you. Thank you. Tim Holden. Good evening. Thank you so much for everyone coming this evening. Um, my name is Tim Holden. I've been in St. Paul pretty much my entire life. 25 years small business experience, running and owning a small business. The capital city has a tremendous problem right now with regard to poverty. Our current administration in place is more interested in building soccer stadiums and shiny bright things downtown the Palace Theater than looking out on behalf of the small people. A lot of the people in the room tonight are very fortunate. St. Paul has got a variety of different neighborhoods. Highland Park is a beautiful area. We've talked, we've got conversations about a development, 135 acres, the Ford site. How many people are affected by that? This is going to affect the city for a long, long time, and a lot of people didn't have their voices heard, which is unacceptable. I've watched for the last 12 years the current administration ram down the throats of St. Paulites, downtown St. Paul, the Saints Stadium. They're doing it in the midway with the soccer stadium, and now they're pushing this through with the Ford site development. We need to give the people a voice. That's what the next mayor needs to do. Listen to the people. 
I can't solve all the problems in St. Paul myself. We have so many problems, we could talk all night. Whoever's elected is going to need to hire the smartest people he can to fix the problems. Taxes have been going up in this capital city for the last 12 years. It's unacceptable. The last tax for commercial property owners, up to 25%. What next? What next? How can this administration even look in the mirror? 25% tax increase in one year is absolutely unacceptable. We need somebody who can create commerce, create jobs, give everybody a voice. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you. Daita. Hi, I'm uh, check check. Hi, can you, hi. I'm Councilmember Daitao. Um, I'm an IT professional by trade, a community organizer by passion. I'm Asian American. I'm short and I'm a liberal. Um, I've been endorsed, endorsed by the nurses, uh, by Bernie Sanders, our revolution, and the DFL Disability Caucus. My family and I came here as political refugee. My father, his five brothers, fought on behalf of the United States. During our exile from Laos to, to Thailand, I lost two sisters and a younger brother. I saw one of my sisters uh, die in front of me. And through all that, I thought that America would be paradise. But when I got here, it wasn't paradise. Uh, people called me chank, t called me gook, told me to go back to my country. It was very painful. But, then I, when I, but I could take all of that. But then when I began to see other kids getting b beat up in Boli, I went to uh, protect them and defend them. The problem was the bully got bigger and I stopped growing. Uh, um, look, I don't want to take this, I, I don't want to squander this opportunity that America has given me. I was raised in a culture that said in order for my family to do well, I have to fight for you and your family first. As mayor, I want to protect all the people. I want to preserve our proud heritage. The people of St. Paul are hardworking, we're courageous and we're determined. We just need our fair share of opportunity and resources. And, we want to pro and I want to help you promote equity across the city so that we can achieve progress together. I have a history of getting things done, doing the police reform, standing up against being the unpopular vote, but doing the right thing and the practical thing, standing up against levy increase. I want to serve you because I want to make sure that your family succeed for generations to come. Because if, if your and your, your grandchildren become successful, I know I've done a good job, I fulfill the promise that America has given me. My name is Dai Tao, and I'd love to have your first choice vote. Thank you. Barnabas Yeshua. Hi. 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 Hello. How y'all doing? Good. Good. My name is Barnabas. Um, I am Greek. <laughs> French, Irish, Scottish. No, this any Scottish around here? I mean, is it named Highland just for the height, or there's some Scots around too? <laughs> okay, well, I've been an advocate for the poor for about 25 years. I went all the way to Alaska to go before the city council. We had a mayor there that was being a jerk to the poor people there, and I gave a short testimony there, and there was some other people from around the country that went up there. Uh, it went pretty well. Uh, unfortunately, being an advocate for the poor, you have to uh, be among them. And I've been in every shelter in the Twin Cities area. Um, I've seen some things that I uh, can't really repeat, some really sad things. But overall, I'm glad that I went through it. Um, I did run a very successful uh, Domino's Pizza before. I had a slight problem with my heart. It stopped, and um, I was dead for 20 minutes, and I have a cerebral anoxia, brain injury. What was I talking about? Anyway, got some short-term memory loss there. <laughs> um, I am uh, French. That's why we're this beret. I'm an artist, and I did bike all the way from Snelling down here. And you guys got some dang long city streets, I'll tell you. <laughs> they are not <laughs> normal. Anyway, um, <laughs> I would like to continue to be an advocate for y'all and fight for whatever thing you, you want fought for because I am, like I said, Irish and I don't quit. Thank you. OK, 
Okay, we're gonna go to our questions and we'll start with you, Mr. Carter. So we're gonna go, we'll rotate the next first, you'll be the first one to answer the next question. So, <clears throat> St. Paul District Councils receive about 1.1 million annually from the city of St. Paul yet their combined annual budgets are nearly 3.3 million, resulting in a three to one return on investment for the city. So here's your question. In light of increasingly tight city budgets, what is your position on district council funding and investment? Thank you for the question. The question is about what's my position on district council funding and investment. Uh, I think district councils are critical. As I said in my opening statements, you know, I think one of the challenges facing St. Paul is the fact that we've made resource and policy decisions without all of those voices at the table. Our district council system is critical to bringing more voices to the table, and that's exactly what we should always be doing. We should always be focused on how do we, uh, with uh, real credibility, with real authenticity, constantly bring more and more voices to the table. One of the things that district councils constantly get uh, criticized for is by saying they don't represent the full diversity of the community. That's why I think we have to invest in our district councils to make sure that they can. We need to be listening to our district councils because if we're not listening to our district councils from City Hall, then why should people who have full lives, who are working overtime and are trying to get kids to soccer, why should they invest their time and energy into our district council system? So I look forward to being in partnership. I was a constant partner to our district council system as a city council member. I will invest and be a partner to the district council system as a mayor. Thank you. Thank you. I'll read it again. In light of increasingly tight city budgets, what is your position, Elizabeth Dickinson, on district council funding and investment? Well, I'm also a big supporter of it. Um, I was on the West Side Citizens Organization um, about a dozen years ago, and that's where I was on the Environment Committee and we led the effort to clear up the, the coal burning plants. Um, I actually made a point of calling every single district council when I started to run for mayor because I wanted to sit down with all of the EDs and anyone else who wanted to sit down with me to talk about issues that were unique to all of the neighborhoods. Um, and that was a very interesting process. Not everyone wanted to meet with me. Um, I was not there to sell myself. I was actually there to listen and learn um, from people. And all of, the, all of the neighborhoods have different issues. The issues here in Highland are different than the ones on the east side. And I do think that we need to make our district councils as much as possible representative of the areas that they're in and to make a really good faith effort to try and to make them more diverse, not just in terms of race and background and ethnicity, but also in terms of youth and age. And thank I, you. All right, thank you. Tom Goldstein. So I'd be surprised if anybody here doesn't support district councils and doesn't want to see that, that experiment from 1975 continue. I think having strong, independent district councils is important. And as a city, we need to be committed to their funding, even if they don't necessarily agree with the administration or the mayor's office, because it's important to have different voices present. They're only as effective as people are engaged in the neighborhood. Obviously, there are some neighborhoods where the participation is not what we would like and we need to try better. We also need to fund a district council, district council engagement person at the city on a continuous basis, not in some administrations and not. And one thing I would not do as mayor is try to manipulate district councils that didn't support me and threaten them with the loss of funding that has happened to some district councils in the past 12 years. So it's a great thing that we have in St. Paul. It's unique to our city. And it's obviously something that we need to keep in place and make sure that's independent, particularly because they're going out and raising additional funding on their own. Thank you. Thank you. Pat Harris, would you like me to repeat the question? Okay. Um, well, I am highly supportive of the district council system in St. Paul. Uh, I'm a former president of the McAllister Groveland Community Council. Uh, uh, one of my life mentors in government and service was for people who remember Kathy Tarnowski, and her memory still uh, guides me today in many of the things that I do about service. Um, when I was a city council member, I put the district council coordinator position back in the budget, and, and I agree that should be a, it should be a permanent have a permanent place in city government. We should fully fund the district council system and we should make sure that they have all the tools that they need to do the important work that they do. Um, they should be autonomous. 
uh, we should support them. Um, we should help them to, to grow block clubs, grow neighborhood cleanups, and do all these things that, that, that make this city great. I mean, citizen government is what St. Paul is all about, where citizens have a chance to be involved in the decision making right at, right at the, the direct local level. I strongly support the system. We need to make sure that it, con that it continues to thrive in the future, that the coordinator position continues to be funded and that they have the funding that they need. Thank you. This may be one of the few things I agree with everyone else up here on, and that's supporting district councils. I think they deserve a bigger seat at the table. Uh, for example, I didn't mention this, I actually run the Libertarian Party of Minnesota. And we have elected officers, but we also have districts, and each district has a vote at our board meetings. So if the city's gonna vote to ban a flavor of cigarettes, each district council should have a vote on that decision. She mentioned the, the budget for district councils currently at $1 million and they spend $3 million, a deficit of $2 million. Before we just blindly fund that, I would like to reallocate it from somewhere else. For example, the Palace Theater latest overage was approximately $2 million. I would rather have spent that money funding district councils. Uh, my barometer is to not raise taxes. If anyone needs that repeated, I'm not going to raise property taxes. Thank you. Thank you. Tim Holden. Thank you. District councils are a part of our democracy. This is common, common sense. We need to fully fund district councils. This is how we listen to the people. This is how the people get, a, get the opportunity to have a voice. And that information gets passed on to the city council. The city council meets with the mayor. We talk about a lot of different things here this evening priorities. What are the priorities? District councils are going to be involved with what the priorities are in each of the different localities. Those inputs from the district councils are so important. We have to fund everything we can to get the people involved, give the people a voice. I have definitely believe that mismanagement of funds and a lack of funding for district councils is unacceptable from our current administration. We need to find a way to fund the district councils 100% and give them a voice. Thank you so much. Thank you. Dytel. Thank you. Uh, as a council member, I want to thank all the district council leaders and community leaders. Uh, you help us make our job easier. For every million dollar that you spend, you do three million dollar worth of service to this city, and so thank you so much. Um, I support the district council. Um, every year I get about $12,000 allowance in my office and I use 10,000 of that to help the district council create a citywide database because I believe in data and the, the centralized database will help all the district council uh, work together to find where problem properties are, what are the trends. Those data can help the district council get more grants and funding. And so, I'll, and I'm also proud of the, uh, my support for the in innovation grant so that our district council continue to thrive. And uh, you know, I would do everything I can and, and my ability to move some of those resources so that we can continue to invest in the neighborhood. Our philosophy is to invest in our neighborhood, invest where we are strong, invest in our assets. If we're gonna put $15 million in downtown, we wanna put $15 million back into the neighborhood. Thank you. Uh, Barnabas Yeshua. Yeah, I w hello. I went to, um, I think, where your city council people were. Uh, there's a place just down that way, I think, where there's a, a community center. And I think there was a lady in there working for what we're talking about here. And she was on the uh, computer searching for grants to help um, fund all kinds of issues for Highland Park. And uh, she was being pretty studious about it, and uh, she also seemed a little nervous whether she was going to be able to find grants to meet the needs of this area. So that was an uh, eye-opener for me. I'm not really uh, up to date on how city councils are funded and how much they're funded for each place and whether there's some competition for funds for each district. Um, I would try to make sure that that's fair. Uh, uh, other than that, I think we should, uh, if we're getting good information, we should keep the payments going. Thank you. Sharon Anderson. Let's see how we get. Well, I'm a loyal 
Donald Trump's supporter, okay? My mom used to do this on her hands on her hip when something was wrong. St. Paul is a municipal. I, I'm sorry, but it, one man, one vote. The district councils have become overpowering. I love them, but it's your tax dollar that is supposed to be funding this. And we're gonna have a 24% increase in taxes? I can't afford it on my social security. I'm at the point I can hardly afford Metro Mobility to come here. They should merge Ramsey County Health Department with the City Health Department, which they have done. The District Council, if you have to apply for grants, that's okay. But I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I say stop the funding unless you can become a nonprofit. Each District Council, which what are there, 17? So if they're nonprofits, let them go the tax route. Listen to Donald Trump tonight at 9 o'clock on Scene Hannity, Fox 9. Thank you for coming. My time is up. Thank you. Okay, Elizabeth Dickinson, I'll give you the next question. Uh, the City of St. Paul is working on how to best redesign the capital improvement budget process. So here's your question. If elected, how will you ensure that there's engagement from all St. Paul neighborhoods during the design and implementation of the new CIP budget process? One of the things that I remember from being on the district council um, was that um, sometimes you heard about the CIB project rather late in the process. And so I think making sure that there's um, timely uh, sharing of information with all of the district councils and so that everyone understands the importance of them so that um, everyone's voice is really represented. I think the sharing of information is really, is really key to getting involvement. Um, usually what happens is just a few people know about it. And um, you know, I, I think frankly that the city should go out and send somebody to all of the district councils and really do some education about the CIB project and how, the, how people can participate. Um, you know, just in terms of the simple information, in terms of the deadlines, the types of projects that can be considered. Because it is a place where our tax dollars are at work and there's a su significant amount of money. And that that needs to go into, and it needs to be um, transparently, um, you know, the decisions need to be very transparent to the people. Thank you. I actually served in the CIB process um, a year ago, and I think while, while um, better um, access to information is important, the bigger issue is there aren't enough resources to go around. I saw neighborhoods pitted against one another, fighting over who deserved a rec center more, who deserved a playground for. We're fighting for scraps, while if you want to come in and build a big project, we will find the money, including rating the CIB and STAR grant programs, which is what happened to fill a budget gap for the Saints Ballpark. So to me, if we're not going to hold these processes, it's a, a citizen process, we're not going to hold it harmless and keep it from being rated for those purposes. And if we're going to fight over scraps because it's limited to CDG, CDBG funding from the federal government, then it doesn't really matter if you have participation because there's not nearly enough money to go around. So we need to improve the pot have more money there, and then, and then work on the process uh, engagement piece simultaneously. Otherwise, you can be engaged as you want. If there's no money to divide up, it's a meaningless exercise. Thank you. Pat Harris? I, I think th there's definitely issues in the CIB process with transparency and communication. Um, the process definitely needs to be more open. Uh, citizens need to have better access to what's going on at the CIB committee, what happens after the recommendations go to the mayor's office, and what happens once they get to the, how it changes once it gets to the city council. So for me, it is, it is really an issue of transparency and communication, but it's also about accounting, okay? One of the things that, that I saw as a city council member was that there was unspent balances lying in various corners 
There was there was dollars in different pots. Uh, there was things all over the place. And you know, I'm a person with a financial background. I was able to tr cobble those together to get things done and to look at them. But it was definitely a process that needs to be more transparent from an accounting standpoint. So citizens need to know exactly w where the dollars are, how much is there, and, and you can't have these situations where where you have select groups saying, "I found you know fifty thousand dollars in this unspent corner. I'm going to use it for this," without any regard to the process. Transparency and communication is where this uh, needs to be at. Thank you. Chris Holber. Uh, Mr. Harris is correct that the process is very confusing and not transparent, and the accounting often doesn't add up. The design of, of how you get money, how it's funded, where it comes from. The city has a great website. You can go through their entire budget and find every line item of what gets spent, what money's coming in. There's a $2 million line item right now to study a pay-as-you-go effort. Seems pretty simple to me. You pay for stuff as you get the money to pay for it. There's a line item in there, $75,000 a year for supplies for the impound lot. Now, Mr. Holden's a landlord. Supplies are things like light bulbs and toilet paper. The impound lot is spending $75,000 a year on supplies. I would commit to a full audit of every department and process starting on day one. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tim Holden, do you want Thank me you. to repeat the question? You good? I'm good. Thank okay. you. Um, it really, but it all, it's all about transparency and accountability. I believe the last 12 years we've had an administration that's done a lot of different things to try and keep hu things hush hush so a lot of the people aren't aware of the things that are going on, backdoor deals that are happening. We need to be involved, the people need to be involved, and that has not happened for the tw last 12 years in my eyes. Spending money on specific things that don't improve the lives of a lot of people, but a select few is unacceptable. Um, any funds that are utilized, any funds that are spent, every penny needs to be accounted for. We have 12 departments in the city of St. Paul, 12. All of these different departments have issues. When I ran against Coleman in 2013, I named off the 12 departments and I named off issues. You can listen to the debate that I had with him one week before the election. Mayor Coleman got raked over his record. Things have not gotten any better. They've gone backwards and gotten worse. People need a voice. We need to have transparent, open, accountable government. Period. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, I'm going to reread the question. Sure. I would like to do that because yes. uh, I want to get to the, the question, um, which is, if elected, how will you ensure that there's engagement from all St. Paul neighborhoods during the design and implementation of the new process, the new budget process? Thank you. Th thank you. Uh, first, first of all, being on a CIB board is not an easy job. Right? And I, when I interview and I talk to the folks that are on it, uh, they're, they're trying their best and they, they're trying to do everything they can from, from, from their good heart. And so I, I, wanna, I just want to recognize that. Um, I, I, I think that the changes that I like to see to, so that we would be more inclusive is that um, I like to see more young people on that board. I think that they are the future of this leader, their assets to our community. We got to start them young to be responsible for our city and how we, how we invest in our community. Um, I like to, um, in, a, in a way, to respect our board that has been there for a long time. Um, we should have board uh, limit so that we allow other people to be part of the process uh, so that we can all serve this, this great city. Um, and this is part of our equity plan, is to move some of the resources from debt services back into the neighborhood uh, so that we can have equitable access and equitable investment in, our, uh, in all of our neighborhood. And the CIB board and the CIB process is a way to do that. And I want to fight to make sure that regular people are at the table to make those decisions for all of us. Thank you. Barnabas Yeshua. I'm a little maybe naive on this one, but I would say write a letter, send an email, call, make your voice heard so the government can get your issues put on the budget. Thank you. Sharon Anderson. First of all, I'm rather naive, but I'm not stupid. 
Now, does CIB, what does it mean? I think it means Community Investment Board. Am I correct? Capital Improvement Budget. Okay, Capital Improvement Budget. We, all these initials, and you know, like an environmental impact statement and blah, 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 but Google everything, audit, audit, audit. Audit the Capital Improvement Board or budget. I don't know, I'm a little confused myself. All I can say is audit, audit, audit. Do your homework. Google is the best search engine. I can come up with records from 40 years ago off of Google. So all I can say, fight for your freedom. Fight to reduce taxes. Audit, audit, audit. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Melvin Carter. The CIB process is critical to how we ensure uh, what I described in my opening statements, that all of our community members have access to first-rate public services and first-rate pu public infrastructure. Having that process be uh, inclusive uh, isn't just inclusivity for inclusivity, inclusivity's sake. It has to be inclusive for those investments to really serve all of our neighborhoods well. The mayor appoints the capital improvement, uh, that, that, that committee, uh, with a partnership of the city council and so those appointments need to be reflective of all our of the diversity of our community uh, it needs to be reflective of all our neighborhoods and we need to know that those appointees are really serving energetically uh, that they're in, in working hard not only in those meetings but in community through our district councils and through our neighborhood organizations we have to make sure that's the lens upon which we build that committee thank you okay we're at Tom Goldstein, and I've got a parks funding question for you. So earlier this year, a consultant completed a facility condition assessment of the city of St. Paul's neighborhood park assets. They concluded that while the city has done an above average job of stewarding park assets to date, there's a large backlog, 57 million to be exact, of deferred maintenance across St. Paul's park system. Uh, in addition, residents have said they wish to continue investing in and, and taking care of the parks and rec centers that you have. So, here's the question. If elected, how would you propose to close the park's deferred maintenance gap? I'm going to pull $100 million out of the sky and solve all the problems of the city. Um, the question really is, how did we get there? How did we end up with $57 million of disinvestment in our parks and rec? And I think we know the answer. It has to do with what the priorities of the cities have been. Um, and I don't want to sound like a broken, rec broken record, but there are this similar reasons is where are we spending our money? We have almost $200 million in tax increment financing for five projects that had nothing to do with parks and rec. And we continue to spend money and defer taxes on a number of programs rather than making the investments in our parks and rec centers. And that doesn't include the fact that parks and rec centers have been closed and shuttered, particularly on the east side, and that we have parks and rec centers competing um, for, for funds that are not available because we're choosing to spend them elsewhere. So I think we need, you know, I actually uh, have a blueprint for a better St. Paul where I talk about a forensic audit where we actually go in and look at the city, but we're not going to find 57 million. We have to start a process of spot, stop spending money we don't have on projects that don't enhance the overall benefit of the city. Thank you. Pat Harris. I think we have to first by start by saying that we're going to prioritize these services uh, and work to close that gap and work work to provide that capital, those capital dollars into those neighborhoods. Uh, um, once we can get there, we, we need a mayor that's going to think creatively and that's going to understand that budget and figure out ways to finance it. When I got the things done in this neighborhood, many play areas, Highland Golf Course, the Highland Pool, all the things that we got done in this neighborhood, you know, I did it by cobbling things together and finding dollars and pulling things from here and there and here and there. We shouldn't have to do that. We need to prioritize um, these capital expenditures and get it done. I've been in parks all over the city all my entire life, and, and, and there's a lot of parks out there 
that need a lot of, lot of help, and we have to make a priority of that in the budget over some of the things that we're doing right now. One of the last acts I did as a city council member is I cobbled together almost $2 million. I went to every city council member and I said, give me a play area in your neighborhood. Let's fix it up. We got a nice list. We passed it in front of the city council, and the mayor decided not to, not to execute that financing. We need to prioritize these types of services. Thank you. Chris Holbrook. We absolutely need to prioritize, uh, which in my opening statement I pointed out we're not. We're mismanaging our priorities. Tom, this is his wheelhouse. Uh, he harps all the time on the disrepair of our parks and our recreational assets, which are uh, suffering at the hands of entertainment projects. The Palace Theater, that was $15 million. The soccer stadium, we've put in $18 million for a 100% privately financed uh, project. The CHS field, we spent 20, geez, 26 million, 27 million on that. We currently have a budget gap in the city somewhere between 23 and 32 million. You can't even figure it out. You add up those projects alone, spend some of that money on maintaining the neighborhood assets uh, would be a way to prioritize these things that I would embark on. The spending is reckless. Um, I don't know why w the, the city owns golf courses to begin with. We never make money on them. Um, I, would, I would definitely reassess, evaluate, and not raise property taxes to take care of this issue. Thank you. Tim Holden. I mentioned that um, a lot of it has to do with common sense. If you have a budget of, well, the city has a revenue stream of roughly $800 million. If we're upside down in the tune of $32 million, we need to find a way to live within our means. Stop spending money on things that are unnecessary and start to listen to the people as to what the priorities are. This is common sense. We all have a budget. We don't go buy cars we can't afford. We don't go buy houses we can't afford. Live within our means. We need a mayor that's gonna take care of the common, simple things that are important to the city, parks and recs. Streets and potholes. Fix our bridges. Stop with the crazy stuff, the entertainment. Let these guys that want to play, that are playing, that the super rich, if they want to play, they have to pay. That's the way I look at it. Subsidizing 50 years of taxes at the, one of the best development places in the state of Minnesota, University, or 94 in Snelling, is crazy. That equates to $150 million of giving away free taxes. I'm going to spend more tax dollars than Mr. McGuire, who backdates stock options. Thank you. Ditel. Thank you. Um, this is something that I, I'm really excited about. Um, part of our Preserve St. Paul's heritage is that what I'm proposing is a soda tax at the distribution level. I've seen it in Philadelphia, I've seen it in San Francisco. What this, uh, so for example, 16 ounces, we get about a cent, right? And that accumulated. So we want to use uh, a portion of that money for our youth employment. And part of that youth employment is working on some of these deferred maintenance uh, uh, checklists that hasn't been looked at or been behind for years. So that's one thing we're going to do with that. That's one benefit. The other benefit is we take kids off the street. We put them in front of adults and so they can take care of them, put them on the right path. And then part of that uh, other uh, portion of that money, we're going to use it after school program where we bring the parking rack into the school so that our school doesn't, they, the kids don't have to leave the school. They can stay after school and, 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 and uh, enjoy those programs that we provide for them. And then the other part of that money is that we want to leverage uh, all day pre-K so that we're investing in, if we're investing in the future, we're investing in our, our, our all day pre-K early ed uh, education. And so we have some very creative idea, very specific, and we are very excited to, to get going. We're fired up. We're ready to go. Thank you. Barnabas Yeshua. Yeah, that, uh, that sounded good. I like it. All right. But <laughs> soda tax. Okay, yeah. I just got my teeth fixed, and I'm, I can smile now, yeah. Um, so I'll be behind that, but I'll tell you one thing I'll do. I will roll up my sleeves, I will paint, I will dig, I will rake, I will fix the things myself because I've done a lot of construction things and uh, I'll go to work myself doing it. Thank you. Sharon, would you like me to repeat the question? No. Okay. I'm your veto mayor. 
I am shocked. I didn't know that there was a 57 million debt deficit. I'd have to recuse myself right now because I have relatives that uh, work in the parks and rec. And remember this, anytime they come, the grass patrol, they cut your grass and they charge you $122 for 10 minutes worth of work. I love parks and rec, they help our children, but a 57 million deficit, I am shocked and I'm outraged also. But as mayor, I'd have to recuse myself and I'd say, audit, audit, audit. Thank you. Thank you. Melvin Carter. Uh, I think our parks and rec system is a resource that we underutilize quite often in our city. I think we haven't really realized how important our parks and rec system are uh, to just our quality of life. I grew up in the Martin Luther King Center and in uh, Jimmy Lee Recreation Center, and they've had a profound impact on who I've become in my adult life. This is about priorities and it's about having a three-dimensional uh, perspective on what building a sound community is about. We talk about public safety for all, all the time and we can look right at the places where we've cut our rec centers the most and see that's where we have the deepest and biggest public safety challenges. But those public safety challenges lead us and right now to be talking about a $5 million proposal to per year uh, to add invest in more police in our communities uh, at the expense of the opportunity to invest in our rec centers and our libraries and those neighborhoods services that can actually help us create the type of communities that need fewer police because that should really be our goal and so my p my focus is on saying we have to invest we have to be able to pr to approach city building with a new with a new perspective that says this is about full healthy stable communities thank you Elizabeth Dickinson so in the broad picture, I definitely think that we should not be using TIF to underwrite developers. And we've been in the thrall of the bright, shiny object syndrome and leaving ourselves having to service $20 million in debt a year um, because, of, because of TIF. I think there's some opportunities through the pilot silent program. That's the payment in lieu of taxes, services in lieu of taxes that we could potentially get some of the larger institutions, big ed and big med, to, um, to partner with us, to provide some of, the, th some of the, um, the maintenance that we need at some of the uh, parks and rec centers. The other thing that I think we could do is to utilize the Right Track program, which gives kids summer jobs, and to partner with the unions to do some of the deferred maintenance through using kids learning job skills, whether it's re-roofing or um, redoing walls or something like that that would also address. It wouldn't address $57 million worth, but it would also promote some pride in the community while giving kids some, some skills. Thanks. Thank you. Pat Harris, now we're gonna start uh, with you with an education question. The opportunity gap between low income and affluent families with students starts before they enter kindergarten. The same is true for minority students and English language learners. There's evidence that high quality full day preschool programs help to close the opportunity gap and prepare children for success in school and throughout their lives. So here's your question. If elected, what steps would you take to ensure every child has access to a high quality preschool education? It's a, it's a great question. Uh, uh, I now have four children in St. Paul Public Schools uh, and actually one that's going to be probably on this stage next year, which is exciting. Uh, um, I definitely support uh, um, that effort. Um, I support Council Member Naker's effort, the, her 3K effort for uh, three and four year olds in all day pre-K. I think it's important. Some of the cost projections are extremely high, but I think there's a way to do it. Um, I think we have to, if we, just like the parks, if we are pri prioritizing this and making this something that's gonna, gonna be something that we care about and we know is important to the future of this community, we're gonna have to find the dollars to do it. So um, the 3K effort that is happening right now, I, I, I vehemently support it and I'll be a partner in working to find what are going to be significant dollars to help make it happen. I'm also proposing several programs with the St. Paul Public Schools that'll put more money in the school classroom. I have 18 years of school finance experience and, and I'm looking forward to a direct financial partnership with our St. Paul Public School system. Thank you. Chris Holbrook. 
Um, education, I, as I said when I started, I haven't been in a school in quite a while. I don't have any children. I would consult with people smarter than me on how to fix this, like Tom Goldstein and Greg Copeland, who've been on the school board. I, I don't have an answer for every question. I typically have a question for every question. The facts, thank you, Barnabas. The facts are that we have one of the worst racial gaps in high school diploma graduation rates in the country. Black people graduate at a rate 18% below white people. I find that unacceptable, and I don't think we found a solution for it at this point. All day pre-K, as I said, if it's not going to raise property taxes, if we can f look at the budget and find a way to pay for it, I'm open to that idea, but I don't believe in having everyone pay for everyone's kindergarten. I think it might also displace the home care centers, and um, that, that would be my, how I would address this issue at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We've had an educational gap in St. Paul going back again to 2013. Back in 2013, it was the worst in the nation. We're leading in things that are not acceptable. We're talking about young children that need guidance. We have kids that are having kids. We have societal problems right now that need to be addressed. These are issues that can't be fixed sometimes by the mayor. The mayor can talk about things, but these are things at home that need to be addressed. Children need to be loved. They need to be given direction. They need to be fed. They need to be encouraged. They need to be loved when they do a good job. These are all things that need to happen, and they're not happening. People are stressed out across the board. Parents are working two and three different jobs to try and make ends meet. We need to create commerce in the capital city. Commerce. Create jobs, livable wage jobs. That hasn't happened. That's what needs to happen. And we need to love our children more than we love ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Did I tell? Look, I, I think this, this is an easy decision. Uh, we have to not just think about short-term gain, but long-term goal. And that's why we got to invest in all-day pre-K. And from the, from the launch of our campaign, we, we wanted all-day pre-K, and that's why we wanted to, we're proposing our soda tax. We want to use that money to help. So there's part of this curriculum, right? I'm going to explain the technical a little bit. So we're going to put the curriculum into the daycare. We're not taking business from them. We're, teach, we're giving them the curriculum to help our kids. While we built the infrastructure where our school system to take in those, the new influx of kids, well, this also allow the daycare provider to be in on on the path to become teachers if they needed to. This also sprang up economic opportunity in our neighborhood to create daycare so that the folks that are taking, that wants to go into that uh, business, they can do that. So we're gonna build vitality in our community by investing into the future, by investing in our young people today, and our kids are worth it. I said earlier, my cultural value is that in order for my family to do well, I must fight for you and your family first, and that means your children too. Thank you. Barnabas Tishua. Uh, I'm going to toss my weight behind uh, Greg uh, Copeland and uh, for superintendent, and um, I'm going to try to get behind him all the way and give him what he needs to do because I think he knows the system uh, better than I do, and he can get the job done as far as I'm pretty confident he can do it. Thank you. Sharon Anderson. Oops, I can't get this. Well, here comes Action Anderson. I'm now the new KISS candidate. And it's not KISS and tell. But keep it simple. Let's go back to the ABCs, reading, writing, and arithmetic. This is a nanny state. Our children are not taught to be independent, to think for themselves. I'm sick and tired of a nanny state. I'm the nerd candidate, or I'm the whistleblower, the kiss candidate. Keep it simple. Let's go back to the, we give our children everything. They're so spoiled. They don't think for themselves. I'm a product of the schools in St. Paul. You know, I didn't know that you went to Central too, but I did too. But, <laughs> but I took on the job training and I became a beautician and then I got married at 17, which I, strong-headed, and I'm still strong-headed. So keep it simple. 
vote that KISS candidate. And it isn't KISS and tell, but keep it simple. Thank you for coming. Remember, Sharon Anderson, Super America. Sharon Anderson, Super Thank you. America. Thank you. Melvin Carter, would you like to me to repeat the question? No, I'm good. Thank okay. you. <laughs> My time hasn't started yet, has it? <laughs> A, a, a quality education for all of our children, for all of our children in every neighborhood, uh, is critical for every goal we have of city building. That's why when I was on the city council, I created the St. Paul Promise Neighborhood, an education organization that's leveraged over $20 million for St. Paul students and families ever since. You know, in St. Paul, you know, we can, we can plow the snow as well as we want to, but when families and businesses decide where to plant themselves, they want places with great schools. In St. Paul, 72% of the children in our public schools come from low-income families. So if they show up at school worried about where, where they're gonna sleep tonight, new library books isn't gonna address the problem. There's a whole lot of things that we can do to get upstream and really address the problem. That's what we're doing through the St. Paul Promise neighborhood. Early education is critical, but the disparities you just described actually reveal themselves even before pre-K, so even that's not early enough. Uh, I will continue the work that I've been doing over the past four years to lobby at the Capitol for pre-K dollars. I will uh, place our rec centers and libraries as intentional uh, advocates and le early learning hubs, and we'll partner with the, our private sector to create a child savings account, which puts $50 in the bank for college savings for every child born in St. Paul. Thank you. Elizabeth Dickinson. Yes, of course I support a uh, pre-K program. I met with Rebecca Naker, who's my councilwoman, uh, last winter to talk about it. And one of the things she said to me is that there are actually only about 10,000 students between the ages of two and four. So there aren't that many kids that we're talking about um, who are falling outside of this. It's a really important thing because a lot of people also can't afford daycare because when daycare costs a thousand dollars a kid a month, that's really unaffordable for a lot of families out of there. The other thing that I think we need to do is to make sure that um, whatever curriculum we come up with is tied to the St. Paul curriculum because we'd like to keep those students in the St. Paul school system because we are losing a lot of students every year. And I think one of the reasons for having a pre-K pro program is um, to get the students in, to get them prepared for the St. Paul school system in a broader sense, and to get them committed, uh, uh, committed to the St. Paul school system. And I think that that will um, encourage stability in the long term. Thank you. Thank you. Tom Goldstein. So in what I call my blueprint for a better St. Paul that I've actually been talking about for nearly a year, I talk about the need to fund all day pre-K and after school programming. So I clearly support this. I support the efforts of, of Council Member Naker for pushing this. But I think a number of these questions really do ask us what our priorities are as a city. And I would ask in 2017 why we are only talking about this now. I would argue that if the mayor had spent the last decade talking about these things, about education, about policing, about equity in the city, about affordable housing, we would be much further along in those goals, but his, what he has talked about is building one entertainment complex after another, funding one stadium after another, and that's where the money has gone. And unfortunately, some of the people sitting up here have voted for those projects, and now they're making this a priority. They should have made it a priority in 2012 and 2013 and 2015. So I think it's been a priority all along, and I think as a city, we need to start focusing on the people and what is going to benefit the community and neighborhoods most, and it's not funding the ambitions of millionaires and billionaires. Thank you. Okay. We stop hard stop at 8.30, is that right? Uh, we're gonna take some audience questions and uh, we're moving to, is Chris? Chris is there? Oh, we're gonna ask Chris the next question. Um, I've been told we have to ask a Ford plant question, so I'm just gonna ask it because I've got one card here. It's pretty straightforward. Do you support the Ford plan Please Never respond heard. with one word only, yes or no. And you know, one word only. Come on, you're kidding, absolutely right? Absolutely not. You've got <laughs> one minute, and I was going to say I've never heard of the. Ford no one point. has what are you guys exercised about? the rebuttal either yet tonight. So if you know if this is your opportunity where you want to do that, please right. consider that too. All right, I oppose the plan as it was processed and approved by the city. I actually, I don't know, a month ago there was a 
<coughs> public input hearing, I got up and I said my piece that the public input was squashed, stepped aside, and buried for agendas of financiers and, and power interests. So I don't support the plan for high density, low income developments in the Highland Park neighborhood. I think the leader on what goes into that development should be the neighborhood of Highland Park. There are all kinds of ideas on what to do with it. I think giving the store away before there have been bids by developers is foolish. The amount of money committed to this will put us in the hole for years to come and raise further future property taxes. I have a crazy idea. I would like to people to consider a mixture of a, a tiny house village, perhaps, which could accomplish home ownership goals, help bring people out of poverty, and not offend the neighborhood in existence. I'm being told to stop. Thank you. Thank you. I agree with Chris. The um, Highland Park community, I don't believe, had their voice heard. Not the first time it's happened in the last 12 years. Mayor Coleman has created a precedent. That precedent is subsidizing development. 99% of whatever happens in St. Paul is subsidized. That's an abomination. We need to create commerce, create a competitive environment. A good city, a great city sells itself. We don't need to dangle a carrot out there for somebody to come in and want to develop at the Ford site. People didn't have their voices heard. We need to stop subsidizing development. That needs to stop. Give the people a voice, listen to what the community wants, and that's the way development should happen in the city of St. Paul. I live in the Hamlin Midway area. The soccer stadium has been atrocious. They didn't disclose the master plan. All of a sudden, it's happening. You know, we've got people with so much money that are going to get free taxes for 50 years. It's an abomination. Your taxes continue to go up for a reason because things are happening behind closed doors that you don't know about. Thank you. Ditel. Um, I, I voted against the, the Ford plant as, as it, it was because, uh, you know, when, I, when my mom was living in the public housing, her house was taken down by Inman Domain and it tore up that community. And I thought that uh, we could have done better, that we, look, we, sh we cannot measure our success in the city of St. Paul by timeline or by how many meetings we have. We should measure our success by how inclusive we are and that listening to people is not the same as hearing people. Because when government hears you, you'll know it when the policy reflect what you've said. And I thought we could have come with a compromise by using a CBA or a community benefit agreement that would bring everybody back to the table so that we can create a plan that will work for all of us. I thought that the, the, the way that it's zoned, that the only people that's gonna benefit out of this is to maximize maximize the profit of the developer at the expense of the quality of life of people that's been there for years and years and the memory that's been made on those ball fields. That's something we can't build. And so as mayor, I'll always put regular people at the table because you're not, you're on the menu. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Barnabas, you sure? All right, I'll bring some seasoning. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> Um, speaking of that, uh, tis the season to uh, let things that are growing die, and uh, I think we should let this discussion die for now and pick it up at another time because we're trying to do too much at once, and we're missing out on on the big picture and letting it lie fallow for you know three months, six months, a year. It's not going to hurt the whole deal in the long run. So I think for brighter and smarter and wiser minds, we should uh, let it rest for a while. Thank you. Sharon Anderson. The reason that I get up, my legs go to sleep. And my girdle is so tight, I'll be glad when I get home. So it's, you know. I'm the senior of the group. I've been there, done that. Eminent domain, the city's become the biggest landlord, flipping properties. It happened to me. It's happening to you guys. Vote no. I watched every cable hearing on that. 
and I've watched it on the short-term rentals, which that's another uh, licensing. You go through the zoning, just uh, I would vote no as your mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Melvin Carter. I think the Ford plant is one of the most critical conversations we're having in our city right now, and it's about much more than how we zone one parcel of land. The core question is, when we find big opportunities, will we, will we be the type of city that, is, that meets big opportunities with a big vision for the future of our city? St. Paul is growing and changing fast. We've added 20,000 people in the last seven years alone, and we're on track to add another 25,000 between now and 2030. That's a lot more jobs. That's a lot more housing, and that's a lot bigger tax base that we're going to need to sustain our growing population. So, yes, I support the Ford plan because I think it's critical for us as we talk about building St. Paul for the future of our city. We can manage traffic concerns by making sure that we're building a full community that's you don't have to leave and get in a car to get a gallon of milk by connecting it by bike lanes and transit. We can do that. There's a lot of process behind us, and there's a lot of process in front of us. My values for leading that process forward as we have more decisions to make is ensuring that it's engaging, authentic, and action-oriented at all times. Thank you. Thank you. Elizabeth Dickinson. In general, I do support the Fort Site development. I support the idea of increased density, I support the idea of making it as environmentally friendly with LEED certification, geothermal, solar, making it as carbon neutral or even as carbon negative as possible. All of those things I do support. But I do want to say to all of the folks who are unhappy with it and who feel that their voices were not heard, I understand that it's not just the quantity of um, public input that was taken, but that there's a quality of public input that some people feel was not honored. I really believe that we can all take a breath, that there's going to be more opportunities for public input going into the future once the developer is chosen. So what I would say to you is that we're not done with this, and I want to make sure that the kind of development we, that we have not only serves the people who are going to live there, but it also serves the people who are living here now. And I do support more density rather than less density, but I believe it can be done in a way with a great transit plan um, that will keep the, keep the traffic down and honor everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. So I'm sorry we only have a minute to address this issue. I support redevelopment at the Ford plant. I don't support the existing plan for a number of reasons, one of which is that um, I, I support an increase in affordable housing and density, but we do not have the transit there, and we do not have the jobs there. And so if people are living there, where are they going to work? Where are they going to shop? The only food store we have is Lund's. The Cooper's has closed. So there's a whole lot of issues about how you're going to get people in and out. I don't want to see people's traffic fears be realized because people who live there have cars that are going to drive in and out and drive to parts far away. And we would be – we. To, to bypass the midway, which would have been ideal for building significant affordable housing because we have the A line and the green line and 94 right there is a huge mistake and shows the priorities of the city are inconsistent. I will also point out that we had a huge development opportunity in Crocus Hill where an entire city block became available when the Wilder campus um, closed and we had no problem a million dollar home is being built there and nobody talked about building affordable housing there. So I think as a city we need to be consistent and make sure affordable housing is built throughout the city and not just concentrated in one area. Thank you. Pat Harris. Well, as a city council member that represented this area for 12 years, uh, um, I created the Ford Site Task Force because I believe that this neighborhood and citywide needed a voice on, on what the vision of this Ford plant could be. I also created the Ford Open Space Task Force, which is a wonderful report about the value of green space on the Ford site. Uh, I was against the city zoning that site right now uh, because I believe that the ace in our hands are the zoning. And when, a, when an out-of-town developer is going to come in here and propose something, we needed to have the zoning authority in our hands so that we could get the things that we wanted for our community. Green space. I support the ball fields. I support additional fields, um, jobs, housing. Uh, bike walk opportunities. Now that the city has zoned it already, 
uh, I believe we need a mayor that, that, that's got the financial acumen and the development experience to be able to make sure that we get the best possible development for this community. I think we need to look back at the task force and look at that process and, and make sure we are getting the best kind of housing for this community, the best design. Uh, we need to look at the traffic. We need to look at the green space. We need to look at jobs. And we need to get the best possible development for this neighborhood and the city. Thank you. Um, we have time for one more question. So, um, there's so many questions here. I'm s sort of sad that, you know, we don't have time for more, but, uh, uh, and you've been sitting here for an hour and a half without a break, so thank you. Um, I'm gonna ask you a policing question. Um, so, I've got three cards here. I'm basing what questions I ask based on how many people wrote something. Uh, I'm gonna read one, and I think the essence of the question is in another, so. Some candidates have talked about hiring with diverse backgrounds, yet the mayor doesn't personally hire police. How can you guarantee a more diverse police department when you don't control the hiring decision? Um, I think really just how would you improve police and community relations as well? So we're starting with, is it Tim? I think it's Tim's turn, yeah. Thank you. Policing is a tremendous issue right now in St. Paul. Uh, the capital city, we have an issue of 75 shootings up, shootings up 75% versus last year. Unacceptable. Unacceptable. We need to create an environment where the shootings and the crime go down. I live in the Hamlin Midway area. I've been broken into three times. Three times. Well, in my home that I rehabbed in the Hamlin Midway area. We're not going to keep a vibrant, livable city if we continue to have the crime escalate the way it is. Incentivizing police officers to, it'd be nice to have them reside in the communities that they're working in. And we need to find a way to incentivize that when we hire these people. Absolutely, we want to hire diverse police officers. Do we need to hire more police officers right now? No, not in my eyes. We need to create commerce, create jobs. If we can solve the poverty problem, we'll take care of a lot of issues by, by just addressing that one problem, poverty. Thank you. Thank you. Did I tell? Thank you. Uh, as, this is a really important issue for me as a, a person of color. And as a council member, I've already begun to do that work to, con uh, to begin to build trust and transparency back in the uh, police department by reforming the Civilian Review Board, by making it all civilian, and by adding two additional civilians so that we have young people up there and we have folks from uh, mental health professional up there to help us do that work and guide us. While I'm doing that work, on the other hand, I'm helping uh, build the, the, the state of the art training facility that can help prepare our police officer to go into any situation, to listen to our resident, and to de-escalate the situation situation so we can create the trusted service that Ch uh, uh, Chief Todd Axel is trying to create in our city. But, and, and I also work on the body cam, right, to make sure that we have some accountability and transparency there. But, but this is not the end all be all. That's why I'm proposing a, a, a aggressive uh, soda tax at the distribution level so we can help kids when they're young to guide them the right path and, and put a roof over family's house. All of these issues are connected and I'm ready to do that work. It's hard work, but that's the kind of work I want to do. Thank you. Barnabas, you sure? Um, I talked to a policeman today. Um, I left my jacket at the last meeting and I had to go all the way back over there and um, I asked him about some of the things uh, that were brought up by Mr. Crew and uh, he didn't like the question too much but uh, it was some question about steroid use in, in the police department, which I, I think is overboard and maybe fictitious, but maybe it is true. But um, I try to put myself in their position. What if I was a police officer and I was hired to protect everybody? And I was like, oh, man, that would be, uh, I'd be overwhelmed. But then again, um, you know, it reminds me of Jesus when he, he talked to the Roman 
who uh, this person, his servant was sick, and you know he says I have officers that I'm over, and I, I tell this one to go, and it goes. I tell this one to stay, and it stays. And I think we've gotten too much in taking orders and and the process, and forgot the humanity of it. Thank you, Sharon Anderson. I've been a victim of police brutality. They poisoned my Rottweiler. They stalked me, causing a fractured ankle, so I went and ran for attorney general from a wheelchair. I believe the power of the mayor to appoint has got to be taken out of his hands, and we must elect the police chief, elect the city attorney, elect the Department of uh, Safety and Inspections. And I think you will have more accountability because you're going to vote these people in or out. Carter had a good article in the Minneapolis paper. 85, 82 or 85 percent of the police live in outside of St. Paul. We're paying their salary, we're paying their pensions, we're paying their insurance. I mean, it's where do you draw the line? I've summarized it. I've tried to focus. Elect the police chief like electing the county attorney. Elect the city attorney like they do with the, uh, the county attorney. So that's all I have to say. Thank you, and Thank you. one man, one vote is where it stands. Thank you. Melvin Carter. Safe neighborhoods are the foundation upon which all of our community ambitions are built. Every candidate on this stage will tell you that safety is a top priority, but safety is more than about hiring more police officers, building bigger jails, and harsher prosecution. That's the policy, that's the logic that got us into this mess in the first place. That's the logic that's over criminalized and marginalized people of color and low income communities from, from our entire community. My public safety plan is simple. It starts with what I said earlier, investing in communities that need fewer officers. That means those safe, stable neighborhoods and the neighborhood resources like our schools, our rec centers, and libraries. It means having accountable professional police officers. My father served 28 years as one of them right here in St. Paul, and the most critical tool is the trust that exists between them. We can partner with our schools to create more on-ramps to hire officers who re reflect the diversity uh, and have a stake in our neighborhoods. We have to uh, provide mental health professionals, uh, partner with mental health professionals that can help reduce use of force uh, and we have to reform our use of force policies I'm the only candidate in this race that's saying we have to enforce our use of force policies that's how we b are become all on one page in terms of when our officers are and are not authorized to use force and that's how we maintain our ability to hold our officers accountable when their actions step outside our expectations thank you Elizabeth Dickinson I think we need to put the community back into community policing. I know the question was, um, how much uh, influence does the mayor actually have? Well, I think you can set expectations in conjunction with the chief. Um, I think you can base promotions on how, how well each of the beat officers, and most of the beat officers, 90% of the officers, are not going to end up on SWAT teams. They're going to spend their life in the community as community police. We set expectations in terms of how, um, you know, what kinds of resources do you have to offer to victims? You know, where are the domestic violence centers that you can take people to? Where are the, where are the substance abuse centers? You need to be able to, in crisis management, to provide those kinds of services. The police officers need to know the community. We need to have them on regular beats. We need to have expectations that they have made contact with the leaders in the community and they know who those leaders are. And we need to have gang task forces that are working in conjunction with the community to target gang members to try and keep them out of gangs before they become immersed in the gangs. We know that those types of uh, policies reduce gun violence. They've been tried in Boston. They've reduced gun violence by 62%, stocked in California by 42%. Thank we you. know what to do. We just need to do it. Thank you. Tom Goldstein. So I'm gonna, before you start the count, I'm going to ask you to repeat the question because you gave it in kind of two pieces, yep. and I want to make did. sure that I get it correct. Yep. So the first part of it was from one card, basically outlining that, you can't, that the mayor doesn't personally hire police. Um, how can you guarantee a more diverse police department when you don't control the hiring? Um, and then the second question, which 
I, I think you can probably address both, um, although I don't usually like to give a two-step question. How would you improve police and community relations? Well, I think like everybody, I'll take the second question first. Um, I think that what, what is missing in the police department is accountability. Now, accountability doesn't mean, it's not means that everybody, that all the officers just aren't doing the job. It means that we don't have measures in place. To have effective policing, you need to have expectations so officers know what's expected, that there's a community expectation. Essentially, we have it to pre protect and serve, which can mean a whole bunch of different things. So we need to have accountability measures where we're actually measuring outcomes so we can have an objective way for seeing how we're doing as policing, just basing it on these terrible incidents that sometimes happen both good and, and used to malign the entire department. We obviously need training. We need de-escalation. We need diversity. We need to actually do real community policing, something that I don't think we do in St. Paul. And you know, there is literature out there 30 years ago that I think the district still hasn't really employed. We need to demilitarize. We don't need heavy military equipment in our police departments. We need peace officers. The good police officers don't have to use force to stop problems. Um, and we need to, really, it's been a minute? OK, well, we need more than a minute to, to discuss this <laughs> issue. Thank you. I, I believe the bear, through prioritization, can, can truly <clears throat> work to, to make sure that our police department is as diverse as this wonderful city is. I, I think it is imperative that our police department does reflect the diversity of this community. And I think the mayor and the city council can be influential through assistance with post-certification, education, and providing young people with the opportunity uh, to become police officers in, in the city of St. Paul. I was with uh, uh, today a recruit that's starting on Monday um, who came up through the system, and, and I believe that, that the mayor can be inf influential in that. I do think on the community relations side, the police department needs to be fully staffed and fully trained. They need to be trained in mental health. They need to be trained in de-escalation, um, chemical dependency, and all these things that, 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 that are challenging our communities today in so many other ways. I also believe that our, our police officers just truly need to be in the community. The mayor with the police department needs to have formalized meetings in the community, be out there every single day, and, and, and get back to true community policing, and that's how we're going to make a difference. Thank you. Chris Holbrook. All right, like uh, Tom said, you can't possibly have a comprehensive discussion on this in 60 seconds. I don't consider this pulling a punch, but I oppose Pat Harris's plan to add 50 police officers to our police department. Uh, it's also public information that he's been endorsed by the police union. Um, I have a four-point plan that officers need to carry personal professional liability insurance, that we need de-escalation training, we need demilitarization. St. Paul has accepted over $80,000 of war hardware from the military. We don't need armored Humvees and grenade launchers. And last, review the body cam policies and the force, the use of force policies. In general, these same leaders, if you elect them, are going to continue to fail to invest in diverse communities and disproportionately imprison minorities. We need to change the philosophy of enforcing morality and regulation and actually have a culture that promotes public safety. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. These are your candidates for mayor. Thank you. I want to thank SPNN one more time, the people that have recorded tonight, Channel 19. Thanks to our sponsors here, the District Councils and the League of Women Voters of Minnesota and the NAACP chapter of St. Paul. Please vote on November 7th. November 7th. November 7th. Please vote and exercise your franchise. Thank you. <laughs>